So let's look together at uh, Acts chapter 8. We'll look at verses 26 uh, through 40 and see how uh, the Spirit of Christ and the work of Christ uh, transforms a eunuch's life. I'm going to begin by asking you a question um, about legacy. I alluded to it in the uh, introduction to the Ten Commandments, but there's something inside all of us that wants to have purpose or meaning. And uh, there was a long time ago, you know, when I was growing up, this advertisement a commercial on uh, TV, um, it was about pizza, um, tombstone pizza. And I don't know if any of you here in Canada ever saw that commercial, uh, but there's this question right before this man is about to die. Um, somebody looks at him and says, what do you want on your tombstone? And in this moment of, yeah, deep meaning, this commercial turns it into, um, yeah, an opportunity for you to go buy pizza. The man who's about to die says, pepperoni and cheese, please. And then, obviously, the end of the movie is shown, him eating a piece of pizza and all is well with the world. It's not really how it goes in our life, is it? Like, as you think about what do you want on your tombstone, what's the legacy that you're hoping to leave behind What are you, in some sense, living for? So that when you face that moment of death, you can look back and say, yeah, my life was well-lived, meaningful, purposeful. It's incredibly painful to think about dying with nothing, with only the grave digger at your funeral. In our passage, we encounter this eunuch. And the eunuch, he has already connected himself to Yahweh, the God of Israel. In uh, Isaiah 56, it talks about, let not the foreigner who's joined himself to the Lord, and uh, the eunuch um, also who's joined himself to the Lord. So there is, in a sense, uh, this uniting to the Lord, but the eunuch is facing this reality of death, of fruitfulness, and wondering what is left after he dies. What we're going to see in this morning's message is the eunuch's legacy in Christ. We're going to see first, um, reading to find hope, second, listening to understand, and finally, the legacy of the baptized, Um, reading to find hope. Um, We see in this passage that uh, the eunuch is reading, and he's searching for hope, searching for hope, and he's searching for answers uh, in the book of Isaiah. Now, where's this eunuch from? He's an Ethiopian. Um, He's a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Um, There's this kingdom called uh, the Kingdom of Merok in modern-day Ethiopia, Sudan, who had these queen mothers called Kandakes. And so um, here, uh, Acts simply is saying this Ethiopian came from that area, and he was in service to um, the queen mother, to Candace. He was the CFO. The CFO of the kingdom, CFO of her treasury. So in that sense, he had a very important position. But he's also a eunuch. And it was common in ancient times for rulers to castrate court officials. You might wonder, why would anyone do that? Well, place yourself in... uh, the mind of an ancient king or queen. What is a threat to your government? A threat to your government is uh, somebody else wanting to set up a separate dynasty. And often how that happens is by sleeping with your wives or your harem. And so castrating was a way to ensure commitment. And what does that mean? Uh, For the eunuch, it means that no opportunity for anything to last beyond his own life. No kids, no grandkids. Isaiah 56 uh, says the eunuch calls himself a dry tree, and that essentially means that um, I'm going to grow and then I'm going to die. There's nothing that's going to remain. There's a sense of ineffectiveness 
and of a life wasted. Now, while on the one hand, that idea seems distant to us, on the other hand, for many of us, um, it's not odd or strange to feel like your life is ineffected or wasted. You don't have to be a gambler with uh, nothing left. You don't have to be a, a drunk with only a brown bag bottle of liquor. You don't have to be a murderer imprisoned for life. No, there's many other ways where people feel their life is wasted. There's even a phrase for it in, uh, in life, midlife crisis, where you come to this point middle in life and you think, what do I have to show for my life? You feel like the world is passing you by. Now this eunuch is a worshiper of Yahweh. He knows about the God of Israel and he travels to Jerusalem to go and to worship there. But here's the painful part. Even in his worship in Israel... His status as a foreigner and his status as a eunuch, it means that he's only allowed to go in the outer court, the court of the Gentiles. He's not even allowed to go inside. Not allowed to go inside the house. He's not allowed to be inside um, the temple where all of the other worshipers would be. So even in his worship, there's this painful reminder that he's an outcast. He's a powerful, he's a gifted man, but he's enslaved to another with no hope for a personal legacy. And so we encounter uh, this eunuch driving, leaving uh, the worship in Jerusalem and going back home. And as he's doing so, he's reading. He's reading from Isaiah 56. Now we read it together from Isaiah 56. And I don't know if you have your Bible, um, but it's uh, worth it to just see Isaiah 56. Um, before you in your Bible, Isaiah 56 is on page uh, 616 of uh, your Bible. The reason it's helpful to turn here is he's reading a scroll, and scrolls, um, so you have a top and a bottom part, and you, uh, you roll one and you unroll the bottom, and so you keep reading. And he's reading Isaiah 56, and Isaiah, or he's, he's reading from Isaiah 53, sorry. He's reading from Isaiah 53. And he's reading from Isaiah 53, verse 7 and 8. Where it says, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that's led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is dumb, is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation who considered, he was cut off of the land of the living. Why is he reading from this passage? I don't believe it's an accident. Why? Because only two, three chapters later, you flip the page, what do you have? You have Isaiah 56. To the eunuch, to the foreigner, here are some incredible promises. Here are some powerful words of hope. Now imagine yourself reading through um, words of God and coming to a place that speaks directly to you. What do you do? Well, you think, hey, this is a book that's worth reading. How does this happen? Is this promise for me? Tell me a little bit more. Help me to understand how Isaiah got to this point. And then he goes and he reads Isaiah 53 and he comes to this uh, passage that speaks about another man who is cut off from the land of the living, who has no generation, who dies in a way that seems to leave no legacy. And so he's reading. He's reading to find hope. And here's a powerful truth of the word of God. God's word gives hope to those who have no hope. 
gives hope to the barren. It gives hope to those who feel their work is unfruitful. It gives hope to those who feel they never get ahead. It feels hope to those. It gives hope to those who have no family. It gives hope to those who are on their deathbed dying with no one around. It gives hope uh, to, ev- to those who have lost everything because of their own stupid choices. It gives hope to those who are incredibly wealthy and yet still feel so worthless. It gives hope to those who feel like the word has passed, us by, passed you by. It gives hope to those who are young and overwhelmed looking for purpose. And it's often that as people read through the Word of God, they come to a specific passage and they say, hey, this passage speaks to me. I need to understand this passage. And what do you do when you find words of hope? You begin to read those and study those and understand those within the context of those words. You do not just take those words out and say, that's all I want to know. Because then you miss the picture. And for this Ethiopian eunuch, uh, the book of Isaiah, as he's reading through it, is rich with hope speaks to a Gentile, it speaks to a eunuch, and it speaks to a future. But are they for him? And this is the beauty of uh, the Gospel of Acts. The Gospel of Acts begins in Jerusalem and Judah, and says, these words of hope for Isaiah are for you in the person of Jesus Christ. It goes into the city of Samaria, a domain of darkness held into the, in the grip of Satan, and it speaks those words, and it says, these words are for you. And then it goes out even further and encounters this Ethiopian eunuch, a foreigner, and says, yes, these words are for you. And Jesus, the Risen, ascended Jesus Christ, poured out his spirit, and Jesus ensures that Philip is there to guide this eunuch. An angel of the Lord, verse 26 of Acts chapter 8, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. It's significant. In this dry and weary place, Jesus sends his servant Philip to bring the fount of living water. And Philip asks him, do you understand what you're reading? Uh, the eunuch responds, well, how can I understand unless somebody guides me? He admits that he doesn't understand immediately, and that's nothing to be ashamed of. Far too often, arrogant people read and decide how they wish to understand or interpret something. But the Bible uh, teaches us uh, that you must Have the Spirit of God to understand the Word of God. And that's why there's there's this movement of the Spirit from Jerusalem, and then the Spirit moves uh, to Samaria, and then uh, into the presence of the Ethiopian eunuch. Why? So that the gospel of Jesus Christ can be proclaimed and understood and embraced. And so the eunuch asks Philip, how can I, if... I don't have someone to guide me. And then he invites Philip in. He reads the passage from Isaiah. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb before it shears is silent so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth. Who is this about? So the eunuch asks, who's this about? Is it about Isaiah or is it about someone else? And it's a great question. Why? Because the fulfillment of Isaiah 56 depends in part on who Isaiah 53 is talking about. If Isaiah is talking about himself, that he was a a prophet that lived and then died and had no future, then there's not much hope for the eunuch. Because 750 years later, there's still the same problem. But to the spirit-filled Philip and to the believer, it's clear it is someone else. It's Jesus. Philip 
in verse 35, open his mouth, beginning with this scripture. So beginning with that part of Isaiah, Isaiah 53, he told him the good news about Jesus. We don't have the specific words Philip used, but we have a summary of his answer right there. We don't have the specific words that Philip used, but we do have the words of scripture that tell us Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That Jesus Christ was like a sheep led to the slaughter. That Jesus Christ, when they captured him, when they falsely accused him, did not try to defend himself, but was quiet. He remained silent like a sheep before his shears. shears. Although he was perfectly innocent, he didn't open his mouth. And in this humiliation, justice was denied him. Pilate, the judge, knew that Jesus Christ was innocent, but did not execute justice, but instead sent Jesus Christ to die. Who can describe his generation? In many ways, Jesus was like a eunuch. No kids. No legacy, nothing concrete that he worked for. When he was crucified and buried, it seemed like everything was over. What is the good news of Jesus? Well, the rest of Isaiah 53 tells us he was stricken for the transgression of God's people. Someone else was supposed to die and face God's wrath. Someone else was supposed to experience this cursed existence. That someone else is the Israelite. It's the Samarians, Samaritans. It's the Philip. It's the eunuch. It's you and it's me. Our sins condemn us to a life of cursed existence that leads to destruction. The things that you and I do that we shouldn't do or don't do that we should have done, that we say or didn't say, think or shouldn't think. The evil in us that we want to hide or that we so vehemently deny with our mouth condemns us before God. We were supposed to die and face God's eternal wrath of hell. But Jesus took our place. And in our place, he stood silent. Not one time did he stand there and say, you've got the wrong guy, it's them. He stood silent. And he opened not his mouth. And he was taken to the cross in our place, nailed and suffered God's hell. And we sinners looked on, quiet, not admitting that it was us who deserved to be there. The punishment that belonged to us was laid upon him. Why? So that God's wrath might be satisfied. So that we might be forgiven and go free. So that we might be restored into a right relationship with God. And that instead of eternal hell and the cursed existence that leads to destruction, we might receive heaven and life. He was cut off so that the dry branch that should have been cut off can be grafted in and have life. This is who Isaiah is talking about. This is the good news of Jesus Christ, that by faith in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven, the curse is lifted, and only blessing remains, and that there is no end to that blessing, that there is no end to that life, that there is no end to that fruitfulness, but by faith in Jesus Christ, eternal life and a full and flourishing life into eternity is yours. Jesus once said, there are those who are eunuchs from birth. There are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. 
and there are eunuchs who make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus Christ devoted his entire life and even gave it up according to the will of God for the sake of the kingdom of heaven so that we might have a place there. And so in the book of Acts, chapter 8, in this passage, Jesus Christ, the King of kings, who rose and ascended into heaven, sends his spirit and his messenger to proclaim this good news to a eunuch. And he continues to do so today. He places people in appointed times so that they might hear this good news. It's not an accident that you're here this morning. It's the Spirit of God working. It's the Spirit of God bringing you. It's the Spirit of God overcoming that weariness and tiredness and that thinking that there's something better to do. And it's also the Spirit of God that calls pastors to preach. That takes a a South African who grew up in the States to preach in chilly Richmond Hill. It's also not an accident that Pastor Park sends texts or calls or arranges visits. Jesus Christ is directing His people by the power of His Spirit to proclaim this good news. So that you might be saved from an empty life, a cursed existence of fruitlessness. Now, before we go to the final point, I do want, for as you grow older, there's this midlife crisis. For some of us, this message resonates. Why? Because we've lived uh, quite a while and we've come to this realization that the same thing just keeps happening over and over again. For some of us, it resonates, but for the younger people among us, you may be sitting there thinking, Oh, I've got all of my life ahead of me. I've got so much potential. I'm going to live a life of meaning and of purpose and of fruitfulness. Church is going to be low on my priority list because I've got a career I'm going to take care of. Don't let Satan deceive you in this way. Hear the message now. Life, fruitful life, is found only in Jesus Christ. And so what does this eunuch's leg what is this eunuch's legacy in Jesus Christ? It's the legacy of the baptized. As Philip finishes evangelizing, the eunuch says, See, here's water, what prevents me from being baptized? It's a loaded question. Um, I don't know if some of you notice that there's something missing. You might hear it and think, well, repent, believe, and then you can be baptized. We don't read any of that. You can see in uh, your footnote in your Bible that there are some scribes, as they were copying the manuscript, realized that, hey, it feels like something's missing, and so there were people that added in verse 37. And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You can read it in your footnote. But in our text If you're a careful reader, you notice verse 37 is missing. And I believe it wasn't part of the original text. Why? Because we don't need it there. We're not told the exact words of Philip. We're not told the exact um, way of the conversation. We're not even told how Philip ended evangelizing. Did he end with Isaiah 56 verse 5? To the eunuch, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument, a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. This message is for you. We're not told, but when the eunuch responds and saying, I want to be baptized. We can assume That there is faith. And what is baptism? 
Baptism is a sign and seal of being united to Christ, uh, that you are uh, living by faith in uh, that union with Christ that recognizes the only blessing of God comes in this relationship with Jesus Christ. In baptism, you've forsaken your own life, you've given up on your own career and your own life of fruitfulness, and you've said, my life is fruitful only by faith in Jesus Christ. Only the Spirit of God will empower me to live meaningfully. And so what is the legacy of the baptized? The legacy of the baptized is this. The legacy of the eunuch is this. That when the names thousands of years from now, when the names of Alexander the Great and Plato and Napoleon and Confucius and Mohammed and Muhammad Gandhi and Elon Musk, when those names are long forgotten, those of faith in Jesus Christ are still living joyfully. That's the legacy of those united to Jesus Christ. What do you want on your tombstone? Some of you don't yet know Jesus Christ or can't claim full assurance of faith. If you are not united to Christ in baptism, and not part of Christ's body, the church, then there is no assurance of salvation for you. Ephesians 5 says, Jesus died for his bride, the church. Believe in Jesus Christ. Be baptized and submit yourself to the Lordship of Christ. Others of us, we lived, we're baptized, we're united to Christ. But the devil, the world, and our own flesh continue to attack us. Continue to try to twist our minds to an earthly legacy rather than the kingdom of God. Beloved, don't live your life or spend your time on your deathbed looking too much into the past as if that's where your hope is, as if that's where your joy is, as if that's where your comfort is. Pray that by God's grace, you can begin to live now in a way that looks ahead to your heavenly home and the joy of eternal life with Jesus Christ so that when you are on your deathbed, you're not trying to list a long list of earthly accomplishments, but your eyes are looking forward and you're saying, I finally received the inheritance that is mine. And why? Because children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren, businesses, schools, careers, a wealthy estate, even a legacy of philanthropic plaques are like grass, here today, gone tomorrow. Your future isn't on earth. By faith in Jesus Christ, you have died. You live, your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, you will appear with him in glory. God gives that to the eunuch. God gives that to you and to me. May we embrace it by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen.